So hi, um, this is going to be kind of the, the opposite of the last talk. The last talk was very nuts and bolts. This is very high level and speculative. I'm, um, I'm going to talk very fast because I, I, I gave myself way too much material and I hope it's not entirely uninteresting. Um, so let's just get started. Um, so motivation. So this is sort of a, a stupid way to start, but it's a way to kind of get into it. So I'm new to Silicon Valley. I, I just moved here um, about a year ago. And um, one thing that struck me as sort of funny and odd is this secession meme. So it's not fair to say it's popular, but it's prominent in Silicon Valley. This idea that somehow um, that, well, here's a guy from, um, from Andres and Horowitz. So like the Amish live nearby peacefully in the past. Imagine a society of inverse Amish that lives nearby peacefully, but in the future. A place where Google Glass wearers are normal. Oh my god. Self-driving cars and delivery drones aren't restricted by law where we can experiment with new technologies without causing undue disruption to others. I believe that regulations exist for a reason. I believe that new technologies will keep coming up with against existing rule sets. I don't believe the solution is either to change the rule sets, which exist for a reason, very nice of him to say, or to give up the new technology. I think we need a third solution, a way to exit, right? We want out, says Silicon Valley, not everybody, but there's a lot of it, right? There's these, the seasteading people, right? They want to move off to little, you know, platforms where they can have their own laws. And then there's the guy who wants to cut up California into six pieces, you know, the, the richest and most powerful of which would be called Silicon Valley. Um, there, this person who kind of wanted rich people to secede, but I, she's not from Silicon Valley, actually. Um, so that's all very nice, and I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. They, you know, Silicon Valley bigwigs get a lot of heat for this, that they're unpatriotic, that they're whatever, but it's actually a very natural thing to say, you know, there's, there's something we'd really like to do, and we want to create some space for ourselves where we're free to do it. And I think there's something really very interesting about this secession meme because I think it's so entirely different from another kind of very analogous and similar secession meme out there, right? So this is about affluent and secure or optimistic young people desperate to withdraw to spaces where they're free to experiment and try new things. But I think numerically more people in this country are desperately trying to pull away from a world not because it doesn't let them do enough things, but because it is too many things to them, right? Trying to find shelter from a world where, um, as a 19th century novelist called it, the economic chance world, where shit is always happening and it's not usually good shit. So it's less excitement about the dynamism as much as, oh my God, what is gonna happen to me next? Um, but anyway, it's, it's a very dynamism that people in this area who are, who are affluent or very young, to be young is to be, a, is to be affluent because you've got the option value of your whole life ahead of you. So people who are very young or very affluent are very excited about watching the world change in exciting ways. And a lot of other people are basically saying, oh my God, I just want to raise my fucking kids. How can I set things up so that all these changes don't make that difficult, right? There's a conflict of interest, a very dynamism that the affluent love are exactly what a lot of people seek shelter from. So now I have to warn you, because maybe there are Silicon Valley libertarians here, um, I am not going to say that, that there is a tech solution or a decentralized solution that can resolve all these problems. Inequality, for example, the solutions that I'm going to talk about today can't actually address inequality. They can make it easier to cope with inequality, but they can't undo it. Um, I very strongly believe in some what would be called big government solutions, in particular a basic income. I'd point out though that it's not a central solution because a basic income actually decentralizes how resources get allocated. Um, but I, in this talk I wanna look back at a tradition. Back before, um, before World War II, before the Great Depression, before the welfare state in particular, there was, these, these problems aren't new, in fact, the crisis that we just had happened in the 1870s, a mortgage-backed security crisis that led to the collapse of a lot of financial firms happened in the 1870s, right? The United States, ever since the Civil War, basically, has been living through cycles of economic and technological enthusiasm. Those always tend to go together, 
followed by some kind of collapse and ordinary people struggling to find ways to put things back together. And so we have some history to look for. Unfortunately, the things people tried, they, they never quite worked. They were partial solutions. Um, and the things that have worked in the past, a lot of them are compromised. But then there are also a lot of them that are, there are some things that are new. Right? So, so these are private attempts to mitigate economic risk. Um, private as opposed to government attempts. And there, there are three sort of classes. There's the one that continues to vex us. They're commercial risk mitigators, banks and insurance companies. And also, declining now, but what I've put up as a new industrial state, the idea that you would work at a large firm and that firm would shelter you from economic vicissitudes, right? You'd have employment for life even if your division, you know, if something happened to the product that you make, you'd be shifted into a different product line. You would have a retirement. You would have medical care. You would have everything through a firm, right? So those are the two major commercial mitigators. Then there's hierarchical aid, and that's just charity, right? That's, that's charity of somebody is saying, you know, you're poor, you're needful, we're going to help you out. I also I mixed in the public welfare and social services. And then the, the class that we're going to be interested in now is reciprocal aid, right? That's the tradition of groups of people getting together to mutually insure one another, Right, to say, I got your back if you've got mine. And that's the strategy that we really want to focus on here. I think it's really important, in libertarian circles, there's often this notion that if the welfare state went away, private charity would fill in the gap. And they say that's what happened back in the past. Well, that's only partially true. It's partially true in the sense of it was, these solutions were never adequate, right? The, the working man in 1910 had a really precarious existence in the United States. Um, but what's really a lie in that story is that usually when people say that, they're imagining charities, like, like groups of affluent people putting together funds to help the needy, the needy poor. Historically, charity is nothing. It's a drop in the bucket compared to reciprocal aid. Right? Both quantitatively... Affluent people simply don't give enough to make that much of a difference to people's ordinary lives, to feed people. And because people are really resistant to um, hierarchical aid. Nobody likes to be told by somebody snooty, oh, you fucked up, we're better than you, but here you can have some food. Right? Reciprocal aid is where we're just helping one another, we're all equals. Um, okay, so these are things that went wrong. Commercial is limited in scope and extent. Um, it's corrupt often, fragile breaks, the, the financial system always breaks down, it's corrupt and it doesn't ensure everything. The new industrial state, very stifling, you have to conform to the corporate norms. That's going to come up a lot for us, things are stifling. It's also just dead and not coming back. Um, things about the new industrial state that I think are interesting to point out is that the new industrial state actually was a business friendly movement that was, is almost precisely the opposite of Silicon Valley norms. Whereas Silicon Valley celebrates dynamism, the, the big firm vision of the economy celebrated eliminating risk, right? Large firms whose purpose was to control the economy and eliminate risk. And if you're interested in that, in the book and the big bibliography, there's a wonderful chapter that, uh, about an early industrialist who was really supporting this vision. And what's interesting about it is how it's capitalist business and it's diametrically opposite to what we think of as pro-market today. Um, Hierarchical aid, often humiliating. Reciprocal aid, sometimes stifling. We'll talk about that a little bit, but it's weakening. It's, it's weakened right now. So that's the question to which we're going to address ourselves today. In particular, we're going to look at fraternal organizations. So fraternal organizations are things that people today think of as like, what, the people who like to put like moose horns on their head and stuff like that. They're jokes. They're like, you know, old, old white people who like to get together for elaborate weird rituals. Um, that is a shocking, a, a shocking uh, slur on something. Beginning in the 1870s, when the insurance companies collapsed, through about the 1920s, for working class people, fraternal organizations were how a lot of people survived. Right? They provided sick benefits, medical care, funeral benefits, life insurance. They built orphanages, hospitals, retirement homes. Um, they provided discretionary benefits, which is something that an insurance company will never do. 
where something not foreseen in a contract happens to a member and people just get together and say, you know what, you know, this person just lost her kid. We're going to help her out and allocate funds for that, right? These organizations that look so goofy were a very, very large part of the social safety net um, that existed, especially from that period from about 1870 to about 1920. Um, they persisted through the 30s. After, after the war, they began to be sort of replaced by the welfare state. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting history there. Their death wasn't completely natural. They fought with particularly insurance companies in the medical industry, and they lost eventually. They won battles early on, um, but they lost those battles. And interestingly, particularly with health care, if you look at what happened um, in health care with the fraternals desperately struggling to... to um, to rein in costs, um, and the medical associations desperately trying to discredit their efficient model, um, it, it looks a lot like very recent political debate. So there's, there's a very rich history here. Fraternal organizations really deserve to be unearthed as a model um, for things. So really, um, that's, they look goofy. I'll give you that. Um, so really, the, the question that we're going to address ourselves today is, can we reinvent something like fraternal organizations with a little bit of a smattering of union and church thrown in um, as a way that would help mitigate economic insecurity in the 21st century? And the architecture we're going to think of is using something like Ethereum or a cryptocurrency, smart contracts, tethered to some, some kind of social network. Um, that's going to have to be there. Um, so... Economic security, is there an app for that? Okay. Um, so engineering, not ordinary engineering, social engineering, really socioeconomic engineering. Some people aren't going to like this. Um, okay. Um, so there were things that weakened reciprocal aid, and we want to think about whether we can address those. So reciprocal aid is this idea Fraternal organizations, unions, churches are all reciprocal aid organizations, as well as informal family, friends, ethnic groups helping one another out. That's all reciprocal aid. So things that have weakened reciprocal aid as an institution over the past few generations are, one, middle-class affluence. In the post-war period, people became affluent and simply got out of the habit of needing to you know, borrow money or really seek help from their, from their family and neighbors as much and offer the same just a habit. Right now, the norms are very prideful. We try to be independent, even within our own family. I think most of us try to be very independent. Um, so that, was, that very much weakened the norms of reciprocal aid. The welfare state obviously substitutes, in large part, for what fraternal organizations used to do. Employer benefits and orthogonal group insurance, right? That is where large employers offered benefits that fraternal organizations used to offer. And they had an advantage in doing so because they could put together groups of people whose, whose risk profile was not self-selected, right? The problem with any kind of insurance arrangement where people get to self-select into them, which includes fraternal organizations, is that you get relatively bad risks. There's the, the danger of that. Employers had this big advantage. They could put together groups of people orthogonal to their risk profiles, just the people that they were hiring, plus they were subsidized by the tax structure. That did a lot of killing the fraternal organizations. The tax subsidy to employer benefits um, really made it difficult for fraternals to survive. Um, and then various subsidized financial arrangements. Pensions and benefits are guaranteed. Banks and insurers are now guaranteed. Obamacare is a new example of a mandated non-reciprocal aid um, scheme for providing help and benefits. So cryptocurrencies really can't address any of these reasons the substitutes that, um, to the old reciprocal aid. Um, and that might or might not be okay, depending on whether or not those substitutes are good enough. But there are other reasons why reciprocal aid died, and that is, these are things that just limited the capacity of reciprocal aid organizations to provide their services. And a big one we talked about before is this economic dynamism. Right? So reciprocal aid organizations, if you think about a fraternal organization, they were, they were local. They were you know, local to a city or even a neighborhood. They were lodges. Everybody knew one another. And, um, and that made it a lot easier to control things than abstract, faceless organizations. Right? When we talk about you know, surface area of attack, 
right? That's a nameless, faceless world where there's going to be people who are just like ping, ping, ping anonymously trying to get what they can. It doesn't work. You can have a really big surface area of attack in a neighborhood, but if you don't have the mobility to ever leave that neighborhood and you attack successfully, you're just going to be shot down, you know, ostracized, shamed, it doesn't work. There's a lot of things that you can do in a stable community there that, that are very difficult to do in a different kind of community. Um, plus, a lot of the things that fraternal organizations used to offer as kinds of inducements, and we'll look at the incentives of this a little bit later on, have diminished because instead of congregating together as humans, we often get our entertainment or live our lives in mediated ways now. That really harmed central to organized reciprocal aid organization was the notion that, that, that people would have a strong commitment to the organization because they were physically going there a lot and they didn't want to have to stop. It was an important part of their lives. All right. Along with that dynamism is susceptibility to corruption and fraud. Right. Again, when everybody's living in the same place and they're not going to move and their families are there, um, you know, for people to behave corruptly or fraudulently, they've got to do it in a very secretive and furtive way so that nobody ever knows it. Because if, if it's ever discovered, they have, they have nowhere to run or it, it will cost them a great deal to run. Um, but now that we live in a very mobile society, you know, I have lived in, I think, eight cities as an adult. Um, we run around all the time. The only identity that really matters is sort of our legal history. Um, if we've done something bad, we just go to a new place. If it's not on some kind of permanent record, it won't hurt us. Um, and um, a third thing that really weakened reciprocal aid organizations is that they lost these fights about how the institutions were organized, right? So the, the fraternal organizations, they developed a very, very efficient way of doing sort of um, uh, first provider, general practitioner care for their members. It was very cheap to provide. They hired doctors on contracts who were fresh out of medical school and offered care very cheaply. The medical association squashed it, right? They killed that, right? So that made it very difficult. Um, fraternal organizations often tried to organize their own efficient workarounds to things in the economy that weren't working for them. So they built their own hospitals. They built their own orphanages. Um, they built their own retirement homes, things like that. As the welfare state came in and also as um, norms changed about things like in institutionalization, right? We really don't like to put kids in institutions. We put them in foster care now. That made it very difficult for fraternal organizations to continue to provide the kinds of services that they provide, right? They evolved in their own way, their own technologies. They evolved their own technologies for sheltering people, for providing care for people that were well tailored to close-knit groups of very committed people and over time, we've drifted into forms of providing that kind of care, shelter, and protection that are much more bureaucratic and formal and that try to protect people from the fact that we don't actually have very good control over things, right? So we look at state institutions and we see that they do a terrible job, you know, they abuse people and things like that. And so we say we don't like institutionalization, we put people into foster homes. In fact, fraternals manage to run some institutions, orphanages, retirement homes very carefully and very well. Um, but the, the norms have shifted against that. That's no longer really permissible, and that made it difficult for them. Okay, so can cryptocurrency address some of the ways, some of the things that reduce the capacity to provide shelter or care? And the answer to that, I think, is maybe. Um, and so here's the architecture that we're going to talk about a little bit. We'll talk about something a little bit more tangible in a second. But the idea is that a, a lot of the mixing, the mixing up associated with... Um, the decline of fraternals, that you just can't keep track of people anymore, um, that technologically we now can keep track of people, right? So we can define now an organization, a, virtu a notion of locality that is invariant to the fact that people are moving around a lot, right? If we're in an organization that's a digital organization, it really doesn't matter where we move to. Now there's a question as to whether or not that digital organization is sufficiently salient to us that it constrains our behavior. Um, but we can define things like smart contracts where we make commitments to one another and those commitments are resilient to the fact that we might move. Um, so that's one way that, that we can overcome some of the difficulties. 
And then the other thing is, can we, with a social network, um, <clears throat> can we create some kind of way that reproduces some of the non-financial intangible benefits that made people committed to fraternal organizations and made them work, right? We'll try to almost quantify this in, in a minute. Um, but we'd be talking about social networks that aren't designed to sell ads, that specifically aren't designed for scale, right? We want not hookups, but a group marriage, right? These would be social networks attached to smart contracts, meaning that in the ordinary course of things, people would be passing value to and from one another on the basis of need or shared projects, right? We don't do that on Facebook, right? We pass photos of our kids to one another on Facebook. These would be very serious organizations where people are making sacrifices for, another, for one another, where they're making decisions that have serious consequences for one another's lives together. They would be very small spaces. And I, I think, you know, architecturally, they would be integrated um, with a kind of a smart contract that we'll look at in, in a second. Um, we would want to try to retain something that fraternal organizations provided, that mutual aid organizations provide, that almost no other insurance organization provides, which is the capacity for discretionary assistance. And again, you need a social network, something like that. Right? With an insurance company, they say, okay, if, some, if this bad thing happens to you, we'll pay you. But if some other bad thing happens to you, we won't pay you. Right? Discretionary assistance is the idea that there's going to be a community of people that's going to judge. Right? Let's not put too, it's, it's not, there, there, there's good things and bad things about this. There's going to be a community of people that's going to make judgments about how you're living, what you're doing, and decide whether you deserve help. But if they decide that you deserve help, they'll give you help, regardless of whether there's any contractual obligation for you to get that help. Right? And that's really important in communities, right? Shit happens and it's not foreseen in an 800-page insurance contract, and yet help is provided in a community. That's the kind of thing that we want to be able to, to deliver. Um, and then a the last thing, this gets out of fraternal organizations but into unions, improve the capacity to participate in political and market action. Right? So both unions and fraternals basically got out-politicked, got out-maneuvered in markets. Right? If we want to come up with a kind of organization that's going to survive and be helpful, it's got to be able to do a better job of acting strategically in political and market arenas. Okay, um, so this is going to be the most concrete thing that we get, for better or for worse. This is a, a, a simple model of what is, a, what is fundamentally um, a distributed autonomous mutual insurance company. Right? And um, the basic idea, the downward red arrows, they don't really look red here, everything looks black, oh well. Um, but the downward arrows are cash outflows, right? They would be ether outflows probably in an Ethereum context or some kind of value, you know, some kind of coin, some, some measure of value. The downward arrows are cash outflows to an individual. The upward arrows are cash inflows to an individual. And the salient things to, to notice is they're regular dues outflows, right? So this is how fraternals and unions all work. You have to pay your dues periodically. You have to pay into the organization a regular amount. Um, things that are a little bit different from that are that at the beginning of your engagement, you also pay in a large deposit that goes into, ex into escrow, right? And there's a fixed term on this contract. And at the end of the term, you get your deposit back. Right. In the meantime, you might get paid money because something happened to you and a benefit is being paid to you. You might also have fees levied against you unforeseen. Right? So your obligation in dues is not the full extent of your obligation. Right? Your obligation is effectively unlimited, except that you can always opt out. But if you opt out, you're going to lose your escrow. So let's look at that a little bit more. Right? We've talked about this already. Um, there are going to be payouts in the contract, right? We're going to have to, if we design contracts to do this, it's going to be the kind of contract where it's going to be a membership organization. The contract is going to know information, probably some kind of, you know, a digital identifier, something like a public key of the individuals who are part of this mutual insurance company. And there are going to be certification procedures that say like, okay, well, a payout can be made to someone if 80% of the community agrees that, that there's a reason for it, that there's good cause for it. And there, there might be a variety of different certification procedures for different kinds of payouts. Um, right? 
as an insurance company, this is kind of an interesting and unusual reserve structure, right? Insurance companies nowadays are supposed to have, they're supposed to carry reserves, right? So they have their obligations to premium holders and they're supposed to have reserves above them. One very interesting thing about the history of fraternals is that back in, in the period from the 1870s to the early 1900s, they mostly didn't have reserves and they mostly succeeded, which is astonishing, right? They were, they, they came, in, in terms of as financial entities, they became important because a bunch of insurance companies fucking collapsed, right? And left people in the dirt. And people were entirely uncomfortable with the notion of giving their funds to an organization that was then going to invest their funds in mortgage securities at the time, and then it was just going to collapse. They were unwilling to, have, to participate in fully funded plans. Nowadays, we act as though fully funded is this great thing, right? It's protection. But it's actually very dangerous. The only reason why fully funded plans are any good for us now is because the government usually guarantees them. A fully funded financial entity means there's a big pool of money for somebody to mess with, and historically they usually do. Um, right? so, so fraternals for a long period of time were pay-as-you-go organizations. And what's extraordinary about that is in a pay-as-you-go organization, sometimes there are outflows that are bigger than, than expected inflows, right? which leads to insolvency. Somebody, you know, there's a, there's a tragedy in your town and 10 people die all at once and you've got to make good on those life insurance benefits. You weren't expecting that. How do you make good on that? Well, in a pay-as-you-go structure, what you do is you ask all your members to make an extra contribution. And the extraordinary thing is that they did. And it worked. There was that much commitment. Um, to the organizations. Um, so we're building in commitment in this baseline model with our escrow, right? So this is a hybrid model between pay-as-you-go and full reserve. Because here there's an escrow, which is the idea is that it's a pay-as-you-go model, but at any given time, um, you know, we can, we, if we need to go to our members and ask for more money, they can say no. But if they say no then they lose their escrow and they get kicked out of the organization, right? And so that escrow serves as a reserve if people aren't willing to, to chuck in money when they're supposed to, the escrow serves as a reserve. Um, okay, so the aggregate dues and payments are funds available for benefits payouts and also for common and communal purposes. An important thing to know about the fraternals is that they were not simply insurance companies that paid out benefits directly. They just did extraordinary things, right? They built lodges and rec, hot, rec halls, schools, orphanages, retirement homes. They founded medical plans, retreat centers, right? They, they defined communities that were, you know, not just uh, this is our town. They, off, they created spaces for public goods for themselves. They did it in a pay-as-you-go way. They paid their dues. They raised dues, they increased, they asked for special payments when necessary, um, and they did all kinds of things. They were both an insurance company and kind of a voluntary local government. Um, so it's this escrow that's really going to be interesting to us, right? So the escrow enables us, gives us some confidence that actually we can levy funds from people if we need them over time, right? So again, this, this is like an Ethereum contract. You can imagine there's the escrow, that's already there. Right? And then the, the organization votes that we need to raise some more funds. Everybody's got to chuck in another, you know, 10 units, whatever unit that would be. Um, and then if those units aren't chucked in, you know, there might be a grace period or whatever. But if those units aren't chucked in, automatically the escrow gets reverted to the general fund, right? So it's no longer a liability of the organization to the person who contributed, and that person's kicked out, right? So it's a very straightforward way of giving oneself the capacity to levy funds, right? If you don't meet your obligations to the organization, if, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you know, you can go, but we're going to take your money, right? It's like a termination, pro, uh, termination fee for your cell phone contract or something like that. But this escrow is really helpful to us as a sitting around trying to design a smart contract that lets that, that lets a pay-as-you-go system work. It's a very sort of easy and clever thing to do, but it's also a little bit yucky. The fraternals didn't do it, right? The fraternals had no need for people to put up funds in advance, and they, they would have thought it was dumb, right? It would, it would be dumb because they didn't have the money. These were things for poor people. They didn't have large chunks of savings where they could put in a, a significant guarantee 
to guarantee their performance towards their organization and it violated the spirit of what they were doing, the spirit of fraternity, which is that we're committed to one another because we're brothers, we're brothers or we're sisters. Ultimately, these things were about extensions of the notion of family and commitment. Um, and so the thing that we want to think about um, is that we now want to think about moving from this mutual insurance company scheme, which is an interesting kind of smart contract, a thing we could implement in code in ourselves, moving from that to something that's less about little arrows that represent money and more about commitments between human beings. How is it that you can go from you know, the contracts that existed in 1870 that were insurance contracts with commercial insurance companies to something like the fraternals where very little had to be written down, where people weren't reading thousand page contracts, and yet they were making large sacrifices for the organizations that they belonged to, right? And so the nice thing about starting with this escrow scheme as a baseline is that it's gonna give us a task, which is can we start with this baseline and design social networks, a social network that would let us reduce the amount of escrow that we need to charge reduce the guarantee, reduce the size of the deposit so that we can still get the same degree of commitment without putting a gun to people's heads financially? Can we engineer a social network that delivers goods to people so valuable that the prospect of being kicked out of the social network would, would feel more costly to them than the financial cost of an escrow, right? Of losing the funds they put in escrow. If we do that, then the escrow can go to zero. Right? If we make the social network so valuable that the cost of losing those ties is more painful than the cost of losing a significant chunk of money, then you no longer need the significant chunk of money, and that's how fraternals worked. Right? They were so important in people's lives that they could levy unexpected fees when there was a need to, and people would pay rather than be ostracized, rather than be kicked out. Um, Okay, so strategies to reduce the guarantee. I'm going to try to go faster. Um, th this is very insurancy, right? The obvious thing to do, the first thing that you can do to, to reduce the guarantee is reduce the liability of the organization, right? What does an insurance company do to reduce its liabilities? Well, it just selects very carefully. Um, it, tries to, it, it tries to limit who gets in to the organizations, to people unlikely to have very serious risks. And fraternals did a lot of that, right? So it's really easy to romanticize fraternals because they sound so, you know, they, they either sound harmless and goofy like old men in moose hats, or they sound very fraternity, yay. But actually they were very, they were in their way very, um, very, very careful and sometimes mean organizations. They were very selective. If you already had a medical problem, if you were already sickly, they weren't going to let you in, right? They're like an insurance company. There's, there's the adverse selection product process. They reviewed you individually from a medical perspective. They might examine you. They also looked at correlates. This thing about correlates and endorsements of members is a euphemism for saying discrimination, right? The fraternal movement is interesting. Writ large, it was actually very progressive because there were fraternal organizations for every ethnic group, for different racial groups. Um, there were women's fraternal organizations that were very feminist. But in the micro, it was extremely racist and discriminatory, right? Each fraternal organization, they were often ethnically bound to an individual ethnicity or, you know, the white and black color line was vigorously enforced, right? And a lot of that, aside from that just being the tenor of the times, part of it is this idea of selection based on easy to observe correlates and endorsements of members is simply if you're gonna if you're gonna tether yourself to other people in ways that are financially consequential, where their tragedy becomes your tragedy in a very tangible and direct sense, you're gonna tether yourself to people who, who you think are like you, who you think you understand their circumstances, who you think their behavior is good by your definition of good behavior. And so there was a lot of selectivity that way, right? And trying to trying to overcome that, trying to do a better job of getting organizations that are selective enough to not cause a death spiral, as they call it nowadays in insurance terms, but that aren't discriminatory in disagreeable ways is an interesting question. Social control, again, this is a place where things don't sound as nice and wonderful as I might have made it out so far. Right? Fraternals imposed very strong norms of virtue on one another and were very judgmental. Right? They, were, they had very bourgeois norms of, you know, you, you must work, you're thrifty, vigorous lives, 
very judgmental of people of dissolution, of drinking, of partying, of excess, right? Um, and that set of norms made it less likely that somebody was going to suffer the kind of tragedy that was going to be a financial drain on their brothers and sisters in the lodge, right? So social control was imposed in informal ways that are easy to do in in-person context, but might be hard to do, might be harder to do over social networks. Um, and again, that's, that's really a space to experiment in. Limitations on claims, similar to the social control, if you, you know, if you got in trouble while you were drunk or because you slept around, they just wouldn't, they just wouldn't help you, right? So um, they're very judgmental, and that was a way of limiting their losses. Um, but for all of that, they were not like insurance companies in the sense of they never had the reputation of being bastards always struggling to find some excuse not to pay. Right? Their procedures were actually widely thought to be quite fair. The norms were widely known and understood. And when there was somebody according to the lodge's norms um, who was needful, they would often pay generously. Right? They would do what they were supposed to do. There was careful and individualized reviews of claims for support. Um, okay. Um, so all of these strategies were pursued. Um, in a smart contract setting, you know, so selectivity can be implemented by different kinds of endorsement, right? So you can have a small group of people that only accepts new members with the endorsement of many others. Everybody's in the same financial boat, so everybody has the incentive to endorse people who are likely to be relatively good risks. Um, questions about whether or not you can impose social control, whether or not you can limit risks by somehow provoking people to behave in ways that are less likely to be ris risky or costly. That's a social network engineering question that I don't know. That's an interesting thing to try. Um, the second thing that you can do to reduce the guarantee, so those were all things to limit losses, right? If the, if the likelihood of losses is low, the guarantee can be low because it's unlikely that there are going to be extra fees required, unexpected expenses required of members. The other thing that you can do to reduce the guarantee is create benefits that members value um, so that even if there are extra costs, they are willing to pay the extra costs rather than surrender the extra benefits. We've already talked about that. Um, so things that fraternals used to do are networking, strategic coordination, in-group preferences for jobs and opportunities. They almost all had a kind of thing which basically said, look, if you're hiring somebody and there's a brother in our lodge who's, as, who, who's, who's good for the job, you should hire that person in preference to the other person, right? So that's a valuable potential benefit. Um, they had their own internal reputation services. If you think of, of Boy Scouts and their badges, or if you think about, you know, badges on Stack Exchange today, right? These were, they had systems where they offered degrees to people within the organizations, and those degrees were taken seriously by other people within the organizations. So that, for example, if they were to move, but they were a brother with high degrees in a lodge in California, and they moved to Cincinnati, the lodge in Cincinnati would accept them easily and offer them generous terms. If they had significant number of degrees, it indicated that their lodge had endorsed them as being a very upstanding and valuable member. Um, so those are things that you can offer to people. Um, the simple sense of belonging, again, that comes down to the quality of what kinds of social networks can we construct. Can, if we did have high commitment social networks as opposed to the Facebooks, can we or can we not replicate the kind of sense of this is really important to me that I belong to this that people had in physical lodges when they met together? Can we do that? I don't know. Um, I, I think we probably can, given how upset I get when I think I fucked up on Twitter. Um, so peer-to-peer um, -peer non financial support and assistance, that's the idea that if the group of people in the lodge are informally helping one another out a lot in various ways, then um, you know, things that don't affect the finances, that don't affect the contracts, then the loss of that informal support would be a, would be a large loss. Conviviality entertainment, right? That was a big deal back in the day. The lodges were places where everybody went together and hung out, right? Again, that's really hard to reproduce. I don't think even with a really great social network, we have too many alternatives for hanging out and entertaining ourselves. Um, and then uh, the last one, so again, this is, this is tilting to, to churches, which are also reciprocal aid organizations, is religious or, or spiritual beliefs, right? If, 
if you think excommunication from your church means you're going to go to hell, well, that's going to be a pretty strong inducement not to do things that are going to get you excommunicated. I love this. This is from a, a Twitter friend. He, he writes beautifully. Um, someone stepping into a church for high mass should feel like they're stepping into a different world, not because it's nice or beautiful or because we want to impress anybody, be, because that's what it is. The liturgy is tearing open of the veil between earth and heaven, torn open by God, not by us. Tearing open of the veil between earth and heaven. Right? Um, if you think that, you really, you really don't need to have any commitment fee. Right? If access to the tearing open of the veil between earth and heaven is what an organization provides to you, it's a, you're going to pay whatever you have to pay. You're going you're to meet your obligations to the organization. You don't need any commitment fee at all. And sure enough, right, the Catholic Church is a very old, very powerful reciprocal aid organization. Some people call it the oldest bureaucracy, the longest, the most durable bureaucracy in history. Um, and it has survived a great deal, and it has been able to tithe even from the poorest. Um, and when there's need in a community, in a parish, it's capable of, of generating um, a lot of commitment even though there's no legal obligation, no escrow fee, no deposit to lose, nothing like that, right? The fraternals tried to take a little piece of this, right? So when we look at how silly it is that they put on their Elkhorns and, and say their secrets to one another and have their weird prayers and things, they were trying to get that sense that, you know, Pascal Gobry expressed before. They were trying to create a sense of a very sacred space, of something special, traditions, and that served the function of engendering commitment, making it possible for people to be called upon and to do their duty for the organization, even though they had no legal obligation or financial cost in shirking their duty. Right? So liturgy and ritual is actually a really important engineering idea for social networks. Right? Again, there is, we don't see, there's no liturgy on Facebook, but Facebook's not really, Facebook's an anti-social network. Facebook is a publishing platform. Right? A social network, an immersive social network, would be about creating strong bonds between people, not flaunting weak bonds, which is what Facebooks do. So if we get into the question of how do we design strong social networks, things that you know, engineers kind of make fun of, like, oh, you know, weird rituals and superstitious ideas, these are really important building blocks of communities and relationships, really important building blocks of ideas of commitment. And whether or not the supernatural idea is true, is Pascal, is he right that the veil between heaven and earth is actually ripped open? I don't know. If you think you know, you're full of shit, right? Maybe he is right. But it doesn't matter for our purpose if we're interested in building communities. That perception, that experience, is a profoundly powerful engineering tool, and we should take it seriously. Um, Federation and reinsurance, right? These organizations, like the Moose, they were really a big organization. They were large organizations, and yet they needed to retain this sense of belonging that can only be managed by very small ties. So they did that by organizing local lodges, right? Like they say in wartime, you never die for your country, you die for the men you're serving with, right? You don't pay into the Moose Lodge because you love the Moose Lodge. You pay into the Moose Lodge because your friends and your, your closest companions um, are there. Your crew is there, right? By federating, by organizing into small groups, um, they create both the capacity for local, very intense, very personal commitment, <clears throat> and at the same time, they create the capacity for large-scale action and reinsurance, right? If something really bad happens in a local community, then the brother lodges around the country would chip in for that community, right? Um, so it's a hierarchy. It's like a tree-like structure where individuals feel their loyalty to their local group, but the local group has loyalty to the whole, and when any one unit in that group suffers, there's the same kind of mutual aid as, as exists within a group um, from the whole organization. Plus, the federated structure allowed for na nationwide large-scale projects like building big hospitals, orphanages, um, things like that that would be of use to all members. Anybody could say send kids who lost a parent to the orphanage um, but would require more resources than a local lodge could put together. Um, so... Um, this is something that would be very natural, obviously, to implement in a contractual way, right? So 
smart contracts that could be lodges can easily be federated, right? In Ethereum, contracts can have references to other, con to other contracts and make, send messages back and forth to one another. We can have procedures by which individual lodges are willing to send funds to other lodges. We can have procedures by which lodges cast votes in a global organization. And then if the global organization as a whole, if all the lodges agree with the votes by whatever the procedure is, the global organization can levy fees from the local organizations that then get levied back to the users um, for some large global communal purpose. Right? Very natural to implement this kind of tree scaling in a, in a, in a computational context. Yeah. I felt like most of the, uh, the contracts in Europe specifically try to solve the problem of trust, uh, where our tied communities are very slow or not mm -hmm. right? And then you can form the contract and not be able to trust with each other, but uh, through a, you know, a technology tool. And now when you're talking about the incredible state where you can really talk really time, it's really sort of human bonding instead of, you know, how does that help? Well, so it, it helps a great deal, right? Because so there's difference, there are two kinds of trust. Right? There's a question of, I trust you as a person. That's something that we're saying we can try to hopefully get with social networks to some degree. Right? We have a group of people that trust one another. But then we have this secondary question of how do we trust? I might trust you as a person very much, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it would be cool to just throw you know, $100,000 into your care. You know, because people have circumstances and things like that. The thing that I see something like Ethereum as really solving, you know, separately from the social network aspect, which is a separate set of problems, is just an organization that's, that's managing a lot of money um, and people just are not in constant contact with one another. Even if we have pretty strong ties with one another, if we're not very directly supervising one another, it's just too easy for, for fraud to happen, sort of despite trust. I mean, this happens, you know, there are always scandals in these kinds of organizations where it happens where somebody turns out to have embezzled funds when they're people who know each other and see one another all of the time. But even if I have a small group of people that I trust, but they're dispersed around the country, and there are several, you know, say a couple million dollars in the care of that organization, if it was just informally in the care of, any one person, even if I trust that person a great deal, it feels like that's an architecture that's temptation, it's asking for trouble, it's asking for embezzlement. Whereas in a cryptocurrency context, what we can do is it's not a matter of I don't trust the people, I know who the people are, they identify themselves cryptographically, and so you know, we know who the people are, and I actually trust them a good deal, but I trust people as much as I trust people, but when there's a lot of funds involved, I, I want to know that there are clear procedures that organize how those funds get allocated and that those procedures are actually adhered to and that the funds that are, that are, that are in our collective name are verifiably in our collective name and not just in books somewhere that someone might have you know, borrowed from and find themselves unable to pay back. Right? So it's just that the integrity of procedure is what cryptocurrency provides. And integrity of procedure, I think, it's always hard, even in small settings, um, but it's very hard in settings where people might be widely dispersed and moving around a lot. Um, so that, that's really where I see. So it's, it's not trust in individuals, but it's integrity of procedure that I see cryptocurrency is really helping with. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I'll try to whip through the rest of this. This is the ideal model. It's the same model that we saw before, except for now there's no escrow. And it's, it's perpetual, it's not based on a term, right? If there's an escrow, there's gotta be some term after which you get your money back and can decide whether or not to rejoin, right? This is the model of the fraternals. Pay as you go, no reserve. When there's an unforeseen outflow, you pay in more. When something happens to you and you need some help, you get a benefit, right? That's the ideal model. The main thing is there's, there's no escrow, and yet, by hypothesis, we're saying there's no escrow not because the system is insecure or weak, there's no escrow because by virtue of our social networks and selection, we've made it possible for, their, for there's no need for escrow. What we're providing to the people in our community is so valuable that for any unforeseen needs, we will be able to draw on the capital of our community um, and will never be rendered insolvent. Yeah? Now, Steve, how about the discretionary and the clarity of the contracts? How do they go together? Discretionary and what? Uh, the of the oh, yeah. 
Okay, so, so for things that are discretionary, right, the only thing that you can have is clarity of procedure, right? So you can say, look, okay, so for ordinary things, we provide certain benefits. So the fraternals, you know, provide life insurance benefits or, you know, if a parent died raising kids. Those benefits, you know, you might only need, you know, a committee of people who you select and so you elect, right? And so the contract knows that, that there are five primary, five public keys, and those are the committee of people who decides about ordinary benefits provision. And if three of them say yes, then a benefit's provided. That's a procedure, right? For discretionary benefits, you'd probably want to have a higher threshold, right? You know, at least two thirds of the membership as a whole votes to say we want to make this expenditure, right? Um, so it's a procedure that's precise. Obviously, discretion means a lack of precision. Right? But what we can do is we can say, okay, enshrined in this contract is going to be how we make these decisions. So when you get into this arrangement where you might be called upon to pay arbitrarily large unexpected expenses, these are the procedures that govern how that will happen. Are they safe enough for you? Right? You might prefer, you know, I want 90% consensus before I'm willing to make a discretionary expenditure. Okay, that's safer for you. Um, but the procedures would be there. Yeah. Uh, two things. Uh, first, I'm the Freemason. Oh. We're not dead. Um, and uh, it's been very interesting listening to this, but I can actually give you an example of where we had within the discretionary um, whip round as uh, Levy, as you're, as you're describing. In my lodge, which is actually back in Massachusetts, we had a, we had a member who uh, went down to look for work in Florida. He'd been promised work, and the job, when he got there, was evaporated. But he was down there, his car was broken down, he had no funds. We heard about this. and. Uh, this wasn't done through, it's not even always done through a formal procedure. Uh, none of us heard about it. We all kicked in a hundred bucks and got him, got him back, to, back to Massachusetts. That's because we knew him. And he wasn't a family member, he was just another brother. We do have formal procedures, and by the way, the, 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 the most lodges, the uh, level at which you have to vote to get funds released is 50%. Okay. Straight, a simple majority. You can pretty much vote on any, any kind of expense. So, yeah. wow. And by the way, not all, we still do a lot of charity. Uh, we give about, the Masons give about $2 million of charity a day in this country. We've got 22 free hospitals for children, the Shriners and Hospitals. Uh, we're still around, we're still providing the Sonic Goldens. We're still doing these things. But that's, a, that's aside from your point. Um, so, uh, um, so thank you for that, and I should I I shouldn't be using the past tense so much. So I I know that they still exist, but I, but no, no, it it should it should bug you a little bit. It should bug you a lot, right? It should bug me because I'm busy talking up this stuff. But I should it's it's a living, breathing movement still. Yeah, no, I've I've seen there's an odd fellows here too. There's it it is a living, breathing movement. Um, but but it but it, it really it really did. There was a moment that moment in time from 1870 to the 1920s and 30s where it was it was it was absolutely a major part of how people lived in this country, of how people survived, right? And the, the kinds of the, the kinds of support that you are providing were absolutely essential because there was no welfare state of, of any significant kind yeah, in that era. Uh, in fact, in Britain, there were many benefit societies that basically dropped dead as soon as National, National Health Service came. Right. Right, no, the substitutes really, you know, they, they compete very, very much. Okay, so I'm going to try to whip through this. I'm sorry this is such a long, I, I was very excited to talk about this, obviously. I, I made a lot of slides. Um, so, um, okay, so we've already talked, in the ideal model, there's no guarantee. It's term limited. It's a complete pay-as-you-go structure, right? The reserve of the organization is in members' pockets. That was a saying in the, in the late 19th century, as opposed to insurance companies that had reserves. Our reserve is in our members' pockets. Um, it's unclear whether this is achievable, the zero escrow architecture in a world where people are dispersed, where it's not, as the gentleman just said, brothers that we literally know in person. Um, but again, I think it probably is achievable if we limit the size and increase the intensity of the social networks, right? So if the, if the size of the per unit, per lodge social networks is on the order of between 100 and 1,000 people, you know, sort of Dunbar's number S, like um, it might be possible to have a strong enough connection, even if it is not a local connection between people, that there is no need for an escrow, um, right? But there are trade-offs between the guarantee size and the, feasi the feasibility of, you, you, 
the, if you're going to have a guarantee that's zero, you really need a very intense and some might, some might argue even intrusive social network. So there's a trade-off there. Um, but broadly, it's something to shoot for. Can we have that kind of sense of family between people who not only aren't family, which is what the fraternals traditionally did, but people who live in this chaotic, dynamic, you know, kind of blender of an economy that we live in now, where we never know where we're going to be in, in a year or two. Can we have that kind of extended family survive? That's the social engineering question. Um, this last point, active security, I don't think I'm going to talk about it very much, but it was obviously very important historically, right? Unions and fraternals got outplayed. Again, neither of which are dead. Unions are still very much with us. Fraternals are still very much with us. Um, but they lost some important historical battles. They lost some economic battles. They, they didn't behave strategically in markets um, as well as they could have, right? And unions are all about behaving strategically in markets, you know, uh, gaining bargaining power by striking, by, by pulling off. Unions actually didn't really fail at that level. They failed at a political level. They, they, they couldn't organize. Fraternals, they really got harmed by changes in the medical system initially, by, which was strategic action by doctors, by medical associations to raise their fees. Fraternals were very good in the early part of the 20th century at providing medical care efficiently and cost, and doctors didn't like that very much. Um, and they very actively organized and propagandized to eliminate that. Um, the fraternals lost battle to the insurance industry after about the, the first decade of the 1900s. Fraternals did have to carry reserves like insurance companies. Um, even though for, the, for that first period they, they were pay-as-you-go organizations and that was an important part of their ide ideology because they were a reaction to reserves basically getting embezzled, lost, stolen by insurance companies. Um, so all these battles were lost, and then ultimately there is the, there's a battle that, from my perspective, is a mixed battle. I don't want to condemn their losing the battle of the existence of the welfare state, because I think we need some kind of a welfare state. Um, but that was a big, a big lost battle in the sense of a, a lot of the advantage of belonging to fraternals diminished when that happened. Right? One thing to think about when trying to design organizations is that they ought to be designed as strategic actors. Right? So there ought to be ways of trying to pres of procedures by which the organization might take a position on a political matter or on a, on a market matter in terms of boycotting things or, or um, paying attention to things um, and engendering the support, inspiring, motivating, mobilizing the grassroots of the organization to pursue those kinds of political goals. Because without that kind of active defense, you're not going to really keep your economic security for very long. Um, okay, so this is almost at the end. It should be possible and straightforward to define, you know, the insurance component of this, that baseline model that we started with, it should be very straightforward to define such a thing in terms of Ethereum contracts. There's really no, it's just a matter of organizing cash flows, right, and then certifying when benefits need to be paid by whatever procedures you want to certify them. A distributed autonomous mutual insurance company is exactly the kind of application that Ethereum was designed to support um, should be straightforward. Harder, more interesting is the problem of can you interweave an intense social network? And by interweave, I think that's important, whereas things that happen in the social network might translate into cash flows via the mutual insurance company. Right? That's a really interesting question and in how you would implement that, whether you would implement the social network literally in Ethereum contracts. Um, but can you design a tight-knit social network that's consequential in terms of people's social lives, but also in terms of financial flows that's sufficiently tight-knit and powerful um, that people, people's allegiance to that social network is so strong that they're willing to make financial sacrifices that might be potentially large in order to retain their affiliation with those networks. That's really the interesting, I think, research, technology, social engineering question. It's unanswered. I, I don't know if that's possible, but I think it's an interesting thing to try and to think about. Um, and then this is sort of a thought question. I like this idea. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have wasted your time with it if I didn't think it was a cool thing to think about, an exciting sort of idea. But there are, real, there are significant criticisms of it, right? So reciprocal aid was never universal. There were always cracks, right? Whereas a, um, a welfare state scheme can be made universal. Um, there was this very significant problem 
with a lot, a lot of how traditionally fraternal organizations got some of their social cohesion was dividing along lines, mm-hmm. traditional lines of ethnicity, race, gender. They were often segregated societies. Um, that, um, you know, are we going to find if we try to organize our economic security on the basis of reciprocal mutual aid again, are we going to find that's a really sort of centrifugal force that, that causes people to, to clump into groupings in ways that we might find objectionable and disagreeable? Um, and then finally, I think is, is, is the mo- most interesting one is this question of freedom, right? Is that on the one hand, from a libertarian perspective, reciprocal aid or- organizations sound awesome because they're voluntary, right? Yeah, in the end, the, the organization might be able to levy a fee from you, but you sign up to the contractual arrangement under which it can levy a fee, and you can always opt out. You can say, no, I'm not going to pay the fee. You just, you know, you lose your guarantee if you paid one, and you lose your affiliation with the organization. They're voluntary organizations. So from a libertarian perspective, there's a lot of appeal um, in reciprocal aid. Um, but there's a question, which is that in any kind of reciprocal aid arrangement, there's got to be a lot of social control, right? We talked a lot about that a little bit, about how, about how many of these fraternal organizations had very strong norms of behavior and were very judgmental about, you know, whether or not a person was an upstanding, good member, brother, who lived up to the virtues that were, that, that were, that, that were uh, elevated by the community, you know, or, or, or whether they weren't. Communities are selective, of people, um, and so you might say that if you if you value freedom in the sense of eccentricity, and again I don't want to generalize because not all communities have the same norms, and there's some very eccentric communities out there. But as a broad group, especially for the very working class groups that were really really wanted people to be sort of upstanding and ready to have a job and not drinking, because those were the things that were that were real risks in their community. If you value sort of freedom and eccentricity and the ability to kind of go your own way, ironically, there's sort of an advantage in having an overtly coercive state be the one trying to exercise social control over you, as opposed to an organization that you are socially a part of that's very valuable to you. Because, you know, the state might make me, you know, do some stupid workfare shit to get my benefits, and I can be like, fuck the state, I'll do it, but I don't care. Right? And I'll go around, you know, because I want to finger paint, because that's my passion. Right? I can do that if it's the state. But if it's, if it's a fraternal organization, if it's, if it's an organization of people who I know very, very well, who have a strong commitment to me, and I have a strong commitment to them, and it's that organization that's requiring me to live up to certain norms and virtues, bourgeois virtues, it's going to be a lot harder to resist those virtues um, and still have a sense of integrity, right? It's one thing to say to the distant coercive state, fuck you state, I'll go through your rituals, I'll pretend and do my own thing because I'm a free person. It's another thing for people who are individuals who you know, who are watching you, who are talking to you, who are helping you out with their own money to take that kind of attitude, right? So there's, there's a strange, there's a sense in which we might want to think about to the degree that there's going to be unfreedom, there's going to be social control in the world, um, we we might want to think about what architecture of unfreedom we prefer, where we prefer the locus of social control to reside. And there are benefits to having the locus of social control reside locally because it can be discretionary, it can be context-dependent, right? There are big benefits to being like, look, you can at least make the case to your brothers, look, I really want to finger paint, and I think my finger painting is worth your taking some risks on my behalf. Right? You can't say that to the overweening, distant, coercive state. So there are benefits to that local control, but there are also, there are also costs in freedom to very immersive organizations that are judgmental about your behavior necessarily architecturally. So I think that's it, and I thank you very much for your patience. I drew a lot from these two books. Uh, I think we'll make the slides available somehow so you don't have to take notes or anything. These books are both great. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.